I am David Ezekiel, transitional pastor for the First Federated Church of Peoria. Welcome to our online worship service for this, the first Sunday of Advent. We are glad that you've joined in. I hope that you were able to celebrate Thanksgiving and connect with family and friends in a way that was meaningful. Having offered thanks, we now into, enter into a season of hopeful expectation where we believe that the promises of the gospel will come into our lives, that the coming of the Christ child will be born again, born again in this pandemic year, born again in our hearts, born again in our world. Today's emphasis is upon hope. During this season of COVID, we believe that God will help us face this bleak night of the soul and embrace it as a womb of rebirth. As we journey with the themes of Advent, hope, love, joy, peace, you are invited to have a candle to light along with our worship leaders who call us to worship and expectation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Good morning, FFC members. My name is Bridget Matson. I'm one of the co-chairs of this year's 2021 Stewardship Campaign. And today I thought I would take the opportunity to come live from the chapel so you can see one of our beautiful places of worship that you may not have been to in quite some time. Today's stewardship moment will actually consist of two different items. One, I'd like to take the time to read one of our generational letters that was provided by John and Cindy Morris. And then secondly, one of our youth, uh, Hannah Breeder, will be sharing her perspective on what FFC means to her. This year's generational letter from John and Cindy um, is one of three total generational letters that we received and next week I'll be sharing the other two that were provided to us by Brad and Mary Gordon and Gary and Carol Nelson. Each year we ask members of the community, our FFC, to share their perspective and write a generational letter so that you can hear from them their perspective on what FFC means to them and how the stewardship campaign can be impacted by your giving through their eyes. So. Here is John and Cindy Morris's letter. Dear fellow First Federated Church members, thank you for joining us in support of First Federated, beloved by all of us. We are asked to share some reflections on giving in the 2021 stewardship campaign. This pandemic disruption upon us has resulted in bizarre and lighthearted changes like the run on tissue papered products, a wave of home redecorating, record high guitar sales, one-way grocery aisles, and the emergence of new dimensions of human interaction known to us now as Zoom. Then there are more serious consequences, like the stressful uncertainty of childcare and schooling, a new culture of fear, the loss of employment, increasing depression and isolation, the inability to visit loved ones, coping with illness, and even death due to the virus. Beyond the dark clouds of the past seven months, perhaps you too have experienced the unexpected silver linings. This time has allowed us to slow down, deepen our relationships with each other and Christ, prayerfully listen for God's purpose, and develop a deeper gratitude for the many blessings of our church and faith community. We are especially grateful as we look back in time, reflecting on the loving embrace of church teachers and ministers who invested so much in their spiritual foundation when their children, their son and daughter, who are now adults, were growing up in the church. We recall the deep friendships and outstanding mentors we have had within our church family. Through joy and tragedy, hardship and triumphs, the shared congregational ministry of First Federated Church has reflected the love of Christ and kept returning us to our purpose of making disciples. 
Let us all work together to continue this mission. Many thanks to John and Cindy for sharing their perspective and heartfelt words with us. And now you'll see a short little video again by Hannah Breedert, who's one of our youth, and sharing her perspective on what FFC means to her. Thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Hannah, what are your, some of your favorite events that we do at First Federated? Some of my favorite events are Vacation Bible School, Gingerbread, and Pretzel Sunday. Okay, and what do you like about Vacation Bible School? What I like about Vacation Bible School is I get to do different activities with people I am friends with and people I get to learn more about. Thanks, Anna. basis for today's message comes from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 40, which states, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. 
speak compassionately to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her compulsory service has ended, that her penalty has been paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is crying out, clear the Lord's way in the desert, make a level highway in the wilderness for our God. Every valley will be raised up and every mountain and hill will be flattened. Uneven ground will become level and rough terrain, a valley plain. The Lord's glory will appear and all humanity will see it together. The Lord's mouth has commanded it. A voice was saying, call out. And another said, what should I call out? And call out that all flesh is grass. All its loyalty is like the flowers of the field. The grass dries up and the flower withers when the Lord's breath blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass dries up, the flower withers, but our God's word will exist forever. Go up on a high mountain, messenger Zion, raise your voice and shout, messenger Jerusalem. Raise it. Don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here is the Lord God coming with strength, with a triumphant arm, bringing his reward with him and his payment before him. Like a shepherd, God will tend the flock. He will gather lambs in his arms and lift them onto his lap, and he will gently guide the nursing ewes. Let us pray. As the voice cried out in the wilderness, God, you enter our lives and call to us to be open to hearing the cries of people who feel lost and alienated, who feel that no one cares or ever will care about them. We have been given that opportunity to reach out through the ministries and mission of our church to bring hope and peace to all. Get us ready to become pathways of peace and life transforming love in your name. Amen. Amen. This is the first in a series of messages on I Believe and incorporating the themes of Advent, hope, love, joy, peace. And today's message is I Believe in the Sun, Hope for Tomorrow. A core component of our Advent services interweaves an inscription found on the dark wall of a cellar in the city of Cologne, Germany after World War II. In that dark and drab place, a number of Jews hid themselves during the war. So many of their family and friends had been murdered and they feared that the next set of footsteps they heard would be coming for them. But in the midst of that darkness, a spark of light was found within and some anonymous author scrawled on the wall these immortal words. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when feeling it not. And I believe in God, even when he is silent. This is a powerful statement of defiance against the onslaught of evil. These simple words shared with the world assert the resilience of hope. May we never forget what can happen when evil is allowed to go unchecked. And may we always use our music, our art, our poetry, even our simple acts of kindness as inspiration to create goodness, not evil, in this world. This awesome statement rising from the human heart can allow you to assert your triumph of God's abilities in these days of the coronavirus. These words will help you to turn your hopeful hearts to see the coming promises of God. Hear them once more. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when feeling it not. I believe in God, even when he is silent. Now, I cannot begin to imagine the horrors that the many Jewish men, women, and children experienced during those years. Whole communities were wiped out, families were torn apart, and lives destroyed. Yet in the midst of the worst period in someone's life, that individual had the faith and the courage to carve those simple words into the wall of the place where they were hiding. Those words may be simple, yet they are so profound. What makes them even more profound and powerful is knowing that the person who carved that message on that cellar wall was facing an uncertain future. 
in the midst of absolute despair, someone was able to find hope and believe in the sun, even when it was not shining for them and was further obscured by a great cloud of smoke and ash filling the sky from the killing furnaces of evil. Now, when I stop and think of my own personal struggles, my family troubles, and the heartaches of those I know and love, everything pales in comparison to what that individual was going through. But life is filled with difficulties for us all. Some of those difficulties seem major to us, and then we take a look at what others are going through, and our troubles seem minor in comparison. For persons of faith, we can be assured that we don't have to go through the dark times alone. God walks through them with us, and that, in God's providence, we will come out on the other side. And this is more than just stating pious platitudes like behind every cloud there's a silver lining or singing gray skies are going to clear up, put on a happy face, or singing that song from the Broadway musical Annie, the sun will come out tomorrow. Because for some, the sun will not come out tomorrow. What does the world look like from the perspective of a man who has been unemployed for 18 months and Christmas is just around the corner? What does it look like through the eyes of families whose homes were destroyed by the recent spate of fires in California and Colorado as winter knocks on our doorstep? How much sun is visible to a single woman with three kids and two jobs? And can a child is being abused by a trusted adult really saying, the sun will come out tomorrow? Advent reminds us that we are preparing ourselves to be transformed by God's love and that through us, God will transform the world. The birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the series of events in history that we can testify to that can bring hope from the worst despair. This Advent season is our chance to recognize all the possibilities God offers all to us. It gives us the chance to glorify God when we lift up those who find themselves unable to see the sun shining on them. Though sometimes for me, despair seems to come more easily than the ray of hope because I press the arc of justice towards greater love and freedom. But I feel like others press against me, bending the arc the opposite way. I believe civil rights are being lost. Voting rights are being challenged. Mass shootings are occurring all too frequently. Nuclear war threatens. Climate change seems unstoppable. Ethnic purity closes borders. Religious animosity rages. And many try to isolate from an ever-shrinking and connected world. That is why, even when I feel the sun is not shining, that love is in short supply, and that God or goodness are absent, that's why I need Advent. I need to remember we've been through this before. I need to remember that when freedom is crushed, resistance rises. But without hope, without the ability and will to imagine a different way of being, and without acting to make our hopes real, despair and darkness will prevail. So when you feel that you are in a dark place, when you feel that comfort, understanding, and hope are far away, Remember that the Bible reminds us to lift up our voices in lament as a means to believe in real hope and the chance for redemption and rebirth. It is the soul's affirmation that God has heard and that God will answer. The people of Isaiah's time were lifting up voices of lament because they had been under the diabolical double yoke of despair and depression. But even in their distress, they trusted that God was out there and that God heard their cries for help. They speak out from their distress, placing their hope in the belief that even hidden, God is still present and close. They confessed their sins, not just because they knew that they needed to apologize, but because they trusted that God is merciful. <clears throat> they cried out that life is hard, but they still believed in God's power to shape things and finding comfort that if God doesn't shape their circumstances, surely God can shape their hearts. 
And God did both come and shape their hearts. Isaiah referred to himself as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare a way for the coming of our Lord. And John the Baptist, centuries later, described himself in exactly that same way when he promised that Jesus was coming to people who felt hopeless and helpless on their journey. That's what our faith is about. When we feel like we're at the end of life's road, God sends someone to walk the road with us and to reveal new pathways towards life that we didn't even know were there. God sends us the strength to survive. <clears throat> Our faith says that whatever we face in a given moment is, in fact, momentary, but that God is permanent. And furthermore, God is more powerful than whatever we face or fear. God comes to us on our own desert highways so that wherever we travel and whatever we experience on that road, we are never alone. Our faith teaches that God's love is incarnational and that you and I are divinely called not merely to receive it when we need it, but also to extend it when others need it too. That's what discipleship is all about. As the popular phrase puts it, we are blessed to be a blessing. As another minister frequently says, God's love always comes to us on its way to somebody else. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. In the midst of our pain, God comes to us with comfort, usually through the people God sends to our doorsteps. In the midst of our neighbor's pains, God longs to arrive at their doorstep through us. Advent invites us to wait and trust that the God who has acted on humanity's behalf over and over again will continue to do so. And Advent invites us to participate in God's creative redemption of the world. You too can be the voice of one bringing hope and comfort to someone who desperately needs it. Advent invites us to participate in bringing hope to the world because, remember, God's Spirit is in each of you. There are a lot of major things that you can do, and there are a lot of great causes out there that need your participation, and God beckons for you to get involved, and you should act and get involved. But today, just for today, do some easy things like practicing moments of forgiveness, simple, kind acts, offering words of encouragement, giving a smile, a hug, or simply listening to someone who just needs to, halt, to talk and to hear someone listen to them. For you can be one of those who prepare the way for the Lord by not hurting others, by being kind, by helping, by loving, by forgiving. Are you ready to be the ones who will help prepare the way of the Lord? And if you yourself are looking for good news, be that good news to someone else. And I promise you, God will come to you too. Amen and amen.
join with me as I offer up our morning prayer on our behalf. On this day, O oh Lord, we come with thankfulness for life and for breath, thankful for the brilliant hues of the winter skies, for the bracing pinch of cold wind on our cheeks, for the lacy frost decorating our windows, for the comfort of coffee and tea and hot chocolate, for the taste of cinnamon and gingerbread. Open our eyes to the beauty that is all around us and thank you for yet another season of Advent where we light a candle of hope, which we need so much in these dark times. A candle of hope for those we know who are grieving for those we know who are sick. A candle of hope for people whose marriages have broken down. Hope for the unemployed who wonder how they'll pay their bills. Hope for families camped at borders waiting for gates to open. Hope for Syria and Eritrea and in Uganda where war makers and bloodshed rule. Hope for our dear planet so trampled by our collective human footprints. We confess that we are prone to despair, that hollow feeling that life is too precious to bear and that there is nothing we can do about it. We often, oh God, think that hope is impossible, but we thank you that you are an impossible hope specialist. For you send special delivery news of a Savior whose birth changes us all. Jesus, keep hope alive in our hearts every day this week. Hope that it's worthwhile being kind to strangers. Hope that generosity can make a difference. Hope that tenderness is doable. Give us strength to be a small light for you. As small even as a single Advent candle. Our words and actions shining for you, a flame for you, only for you, you who are our God of hope. Amen and amen. As we conclude our worship service this first Sunday in Advent, let me remind you that we are a people of hope. Now, hope is not wishing for something to happen. Hope is believing 
that when you take action, that the Almighty will cause a spark and that something marvelous will transpire. Therefore, in this week, as we wait for justice, we do not wait to work for change. We wait for restored health, but we do not wait to work to heal. We wait for wholeness, but we do not wait to work at binding brokenness. We wait for peace, but we do not wait to work to eliminate hatred. And so, my friends, like bells ringing out the news that the sun still shines even on cloudy days, fill the night left by sadness with messages of hope. Go into your lives humming the tunes that keep that hope alive in you and that spur you on in your work of justice and reconciliation. Go bringing hope and peace into the darkened world, for God is bringing light into our darkness through the light that is within you. For God is calling you to go out into the world, confident in God's loving presence to serve others in need. Therefore, go in God's love. Amen and amen. And I'll see you again next week. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior.